It is now time for your annual favorite show for Vacation Bible School. It's Vacation Bible School Trivia. And your host, Johnny Everything, here's Johnny. Hey, boys and girls. Well, you know, when you think about it, We've had a great week this week. We've met a lot of friends. We've done a lot of things. We've had a lot of laughs. We've had really good fellowship. We've had a lot of fun. But most importantly, you've learned a lot this week about God's treasures. And tonight, you'll get another opportunity for that. But you know, Mr. Craig, I'm thinking that I'll get some of my old friends to come up here. And they'll help me with a little bit of this trivial game. So we'll ask some questions of our audience. Rally Sally, won't you come up? Rally, rally. Okay. The pitcher name is Sally. <laughs> Sally, you got anything to say? No, I mean, like, I just, hello. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the questions. To start. Uh, okay, yeah. And what about my good old friend and ne nemesis at times, Bronco Billy? All right. Hello there, you little tadpole. Well, at least you didn't get dehydrated this year. You know, the five signs. Yes. But the night's not over yet. <laughs> this is true. All right, let's get started, Mr. Craig. First question we'll give to Sally. Sally, you got a question okay. for these kids? Yes, I do. Okay. okay. Here goes. Raise your hand if you know the answer. What? Don't yell it out. What? Go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. What road was the man robbed on in the story about the Good Samaritan? What Well, you know, I sang a song last night. It's an old song that we used to sing. Maybe we'd sing it more. We might actually know the answer. But uh, what was that old road from Jerusalem down to where? Ah, there you go. Good job. Good job. Hey, I've got a question. How many men walked right by... The guy that got beaten, how many of them walked right by him? I mean, just. All right, very good. Hey, Bronco Belly, do you have a, uh, a question or two for the kids? 
Yeah, uh, where was the man who helped him? Who, where was he from? Did anybody know where he was I from, the guy that Nigeria helped him? I think Nigeria or something. Maybe it was uh, California? I don't think it was California. Where was the man from? The yeah, the good one. Well, now, Jesus told the story. Is there a town named Jesus? Where was the man from that got robbed and got beat up when the guy came and put him on his donkey? Where was that good guy from that helped him? Yeah. The good what? Ah. Yeah. Maybe we need to brush up on that, teachers. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, Bronco Bill, you got another question? Yeah. It's, um, what all did he do for the man who had been robbed? What were some of the things that he did for this man that had been beaten up and he had been left on the side of the road? And what, what all did they do for him? Very good, very good. Hey, uh, Bear, come up here and ask a question. Oh, okay. Okay, Ooh, I've got a question. Just give me a minute here. Where's As I was traveling down the road, I began to ponder over a question, and here's my question. How many fishermen did Jesus call by the Sea of Galilee? Oh, you are so right. And can anyone? Four. Yeah, it was four. Well, the four. Yeah. <laughs> and? All right. Oh, that's so good. Hey, Sally. Can you hold your arm up a little longer and ask a question? <laughs> Get you out your glasses. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. What were some of the characteristics of these fishermen? Oh, what? that's a deep question. It reminds me of the time I was in the canyon. I was down there in the deep canyon, just falling away. Okay, go ahead. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so um yeah, his old age creeps <laughs> kinda getting a little creaky. Why did Jesus choose these men? Why did Jesus choose these men? Oh, that's a good question. That's a way to reword it. Yeah. What was special about him? There you go. Special. Yeah. Good job. Hey, that's a great answer. And we'll ask one more question from Bronco Billy. Somebody, uh, somebody answered correctly and said dedication. What does dedication mean? That's deep. Yeah, very good. Very Who's the good. king of the jungle? He's the king of the jungle. He's the king of the jungle. How do you get in here? Mr. Green, can we sing? We're kind of far from this game. Can we sing? Who's the king of the jungle? Wait the day. Yeah, she always asks the question. Me, I want to sing. He's the 
This should be good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. This is the king of the Yeah. Let's sing it. Let's go. Come on. This is the king of the jingle. Yeah. It's now time for the second part of Question Time. Trivial, and we'll, well, look, it's Dr. Pendyke. Hey, you know, Dr. Pendyke, you're a pretty cool guy. I think you're related to me. Would you like to ask a question? Yes. Any time, Dr. Pendyke. I'm trying to read this script here. What does God look at in a man or a woman? What oh, does he look at? That's a good question. What does God look for? Yeah. Oh, that's All excellent. Right. That's an excellent answer. Correct. Dr. You got another question, Dr. Pendyke? How did the woman clean Jesus' feet? Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a good guess. Logical. <laughs> Great job on that lesson. <laughs> Where did the water come from? You know, you know, right? Yeah. That, yeah, that was good. Hey, Mr. Craig, I've got a question. Hey, kids, who was the most, one of the most, if not the most generous woman wrote about in the New Testament. It was a story you studied this week. What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, kids, you know, the widow had a really good heart. And now it's time that we say good old bye to Rally Sally. See you. Bye, guys. See you next year. Yeah, see you next year. You have a contract. Um, <laughs> Dr. Pendyke? Yes. You're well, relatively new to the, to the old bunch. What do you got planned for tomorrow? 
gonna have to put a heat pack on my shoulder. It's, it's cramping. Well, we really appreciated you, Dr. Pendyne. Where's old Bronco Belly? He's, uh, he's laying down. <laughs> Taking a siesta. Well, tell Bronco Belly we said bye. And kids, you gotta know we love you. And so let's sing a song about God's love. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He answers prayers. He answers prayers. He prayers. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to me. Well, see you later, Mr. Craig. See you next time.
test. Anybody need any help getting up out there if you were down? <laughs> well, welcome to the last night, and it's been a wonderful week. And uh, we want to thank, uh, right now I want to thank Bill for being here uh, this week and sharing with us the, uh, the words of, uh, of James, from the book of James in the New Testament, on faith in troubled times. And we appreciate it, and we have learned a lot. I, I, let me say, I have learned a lot, and I have uh, uh, learned a lot about myself, and I've learned a lot about what God has for me. And I'm looking forward to tonight, and we appreciate your presence every night. Some of you have been here every night, and uh, I know you've been beneficial, or benefited from all of this in a, in a wonderful way. And so uh, I want to give him all the time he needs, and so let's pause and go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, once again, we want to just thank you for the health that allows us to come here, for the country in which we live that gives us the freedom of this assembly. And we thank you, God, that uh, you have uh, provided us a means by which we can live forever through your son, Jesus. And uh, again, we thank you for uh, Bill Hooten and for his study, for his research and for his knowledge and experience and and for his ability to articulate it and share it with us each evening this week. Bless him tonight, Father, that uh, he can communicate uh, clearly the, the words that you would have us to know, and then give us the boldness to go out and share that good word with others. Help us tonight, Father, and bless us that we can be a blessing to someone else. We give you the glory and the praise for all things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And again, I want to thank you for your presence tonight, for being here. It has been a real privilege. Uh, I enjoy talking about James, as I said last night. I appreciate the kind remarks that you've made and for your patience in putting up with me. Uh, it, has, it has been a good time seeing people that I haven't seen in years and have enjoyed the opportunity to be here with you. I'm going to show you a slide tonight to begin with, that has nothing to do with my lesson. It's just one of those things that I saw, and I will tell you up front, it brought a tear to my eye when I saw it. And it's just one of those things that I try to share every time I have an opportunity. You can't hardly see it. It's a, the name of the, it's an awesome painting. It's an awesome painting of the first day in heaven. And if you could see that, it would show you a woman hugging Jesus. And it is, it is a very powerful, powerful painting. And like I said, the first time I saw it, it, it touched me. It, like I said, brought tears to my eyes. Tonight, the role of faith for the tough times. Number four, the end result of trials. Now, this is not... Somebody was going to turn them off for me, weren't they? Okay. Uh, it, it, this is not the end of the discussion of trials in James. You could go for another two, three lessons talking about trials and what they are. Let me back that up and see if you can see it any better. Like I said, that just touched me when I saw it. So... Anyway, I wanted to share that with you. Roll of faith for the tough times. Our text is James chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 12 through 15. This is the English standard that's on the board here. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. The end result of trials. Last night I talked about how much I enjoy reading. I have always had a problem in school though. I had it all the way through graduate school. I like to read what I want to read. I don't like to be told what I had to read. Literature was always really tough for me. 11th grade, I had a, a class English, and half of the year, we did grammar and punctuation. Used Faulkner's book, uh, workbook that they used at the university, if you ever used that. And the second semester, it was about literature. I did terrible at both of them. Uh, I had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Creighton. If you went to Springdale High School from 67 through about 82 or 83, you know who Mrs. Creighton is. She was a retired drill instructor from the Marines. And, and that, that's not a joke, that's true. She was a retired ins drill instructor from the Marines. And she taught her classes like a drill instructor. I had a problem reading the stuff she wanted me to read. Now she could give me a book on sports, or a western, or something that I liked, I could read it overnight. But to read some of the stuff she wanted me to read, it, it was just a chore. And, and part of the problem I had with literature is that when you read literature for school, not only you just read it for the joy of reading, you have to figure out what the author meant when he wrote it. Well, since I never did read it very well, I never could figure out what the author was trying to say when he wrote it. One of the things that gave me the most problem was this journal here. Anybody ever have to read the rhyme of the ancient mariner? Did you like it? <laughs> Man after my own heart. Uh, and, and it's, it's a wonderful story. Uh, after I got old enough that I could sit down and read it because I wanted to read it, 11th grade, it didn't make any sense to me. It's written by Samuel Taylor Coldridge. And like I said, it's a fascinating, wonderful story. It's about a man who's on his way to a wedding, and he meets a, a, an old man that is a mariner, uh, a seagoer. And as they're walking along, the, the mariner begins to tell him a tale. And he tells him a tale about the last voyage that he was out on. And they got caught in a winter storm. And they were afraid that everything was going to be lost. And an albatross, some kind of seabird, directed them out of the storm. And the men on the boat adopted that albatross as their mascot sort of and they kept it well this old mariner got upset about something and he killed the albatross made every other sailor on that boat really mad at him that's the albatross that's our good luck piece he's the one that led us to safety from the storm and you've killed him we're going to make you wear that albatross around the neck your neck for the rest of this voyage Anybody ever heard the expression, this, this problem is an albatross around my neck? Well, that's where that came from. And, and after the man got back, he was the only one that survived that voyage. And after he got back, he just walked around. And everybody he met, he told the story to. He spent his life telling the story of his last voyage and the albatross and what a problem it had been for him. Now, without a doubt, the trials of life are an albatross around our neck. We have to, to wear those things, we have to put up those things, 
They, they describe what's going on with us. There are problems that we face. I have a friend, he's passed now, had a friend that he and his wife, somewhere in their growing up within the churches of Christ, came across the idea that if they did what they were supposed to do, they would never have any problems. Well, they went through about a year period where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. It was one problem right after another. It just multiplied upon them. Do you know what they decided? They decided being good, doing what the Lord wanted you to do, there was no benefit to it. So they quit going to church. His uncle was a preacher. His daddy was an elder. They just gave up, said, you know, it's just not worth it. We thought we were doing everything right, and look at all the things, bad things that have happened to us. We eventually got him back. Uh, we got him back by asking him to play softball. He loved to play softball. From there, we got him to church and got him back and, and taught him, and we went over things together. Christians are confronted with all the troubles and the calamities that everybody else faces in the world. Christianity is no rose garden that promises you that nothing bad will ever happen to you. I, I have talked about Twitter a lot this week and probably shouldn't talk about it as much as I do, but I use Twitter. In fact, every day I go to Twitter and I print off the things that I like and I've got a file about yay thick of tweets that I have printed off and I have written beside them what they'll use, how I can use them in a sermon. I was getting ready to preach this series of sermons on James and this one of this one came up. It says, though our investments go down or our furnaces blow up, our dream job is a nightmare or our vacation gets canceled, we will rejoice in you. Though the house contract falls through or our insurance doesn't pay up, we will rejoice in you. About 10 minutes after he posted that one, this one came up. Though the sales are malignant, our boss is belligerent, though our children think our faith is silly, the Bible, they think the Bible is fable and life is futile, we will rejoice in you. Though our pastor fails us, a co-worker slanders us, or a friend betrayed us, we will rejoice in you. Well, I took both of those, posted them together on my Facebook page, and shared them. About five minutes after I had them put up, my sister responded to them, said, those are tough. You know what? They are. Life's tough. We have to continue to overcome problems, overcome trials. We have to continue to rejoice in Jesus, and they are tough. That same day, about three hours later, this came up. Faith does not minimize problems. Faith magnifies God's promises. Don't pretend it's not hard, but keep believing he's good. You know, those are the things we've been talking about this week. That's what James is trying to get across to us. That's the message that he wants us to have. Now, this is our fourth lesson. First lesson we talked about that we're to consider trials as joy. Not because they're easy, not because they don't hurt, not because they are joyous, but because they give us an opportunity to grow and to trust God and to depend on Him. The second thing we talked about was when we have troubles and we struggle with them and nothing is going the way that we think that it ought to go and we're having difficulty holding on to God and we need wisdom from Him to be able to handle this problem, we got to ask Him. We'd have to learn to depend on Him. And then last night, we talked about the fact of whether you're rich or you're poor. 
you still got trials. In fact, sometimes your riches are trials, and sometimes your poverty is a trial. And, and so that, so tonight we're going to talk about the end result of trials. We've been talking about trials and tests. Usually, when you have a test, there's a result or a grade. We're going to find out what the result, how, what do we do with this? The real danger for the Christian is failing and allowing the trials of life on the outside to become temptations on the inside. When I struggle with a problem, whether it's financial difficulty, whether it's a health problem, whether it's a, a marital problem or a parenting problem, if I allow those things that are going on around me in my life to get inside of me and take over, then I have failed the test. I have to keep strong on the inside in God. The ultimate outcome is dependent upon the difference we allow faith to make in our lives. Faith is not just knowledge. I'll tell you a real quick story. Back in the 90s, I was a manager of a petroleum equipment company. Uh, we did all the maintenance and, and work for Easy Mark. And we had six branches in Missouri, Arkansas, Texas, and Oklahoma. And I was the manager of the one in Springdale. Well, to do that kind of work, you had to have certain licenses that you had to get from the Department of Environmental Quality. And Oklahoma came up with a new license that they wanted you to have. It was about the procedures for safely installing above ground gasoline tanks. And there's a whole different set of rules for that than there is for an underground. If we got firemen in here, they can tell you those, those above ground tanks have a different set of rules. Well, the state of Oklahoma decided everybody needed to be licensed for that and they wrote a test for it. Our company sent seven guys to take the test. Not one of them passed it. In fact, in the whole state of Oklahoma, of the first hundred people that took it, three people passed it. My boss called me one morning. We had three above ground storage tank jobs coming up in Oklahoma. He said, Bill, I got a problem. I said, what is it, boss? He said, can you pass that stupid test? I said, yeah, send me the material. So they sent me the material. I studied the material. I passed it. I was the fifth person to take the test in the state of Oklahoma and pass it. Well, about six weeks after I passed it, and I was the only one in the company with that license, about six weeks after I passed it, the head of the construction company, the construction part of our company called me, and he was in Texas putting in above ground tank. And he says, Bill, he said, when you get down there, that check valve that you would put down at the bottom, how far does it have to be away from the tank and what angle does it? I said, Duke, I don't know. He said, Bill, you're the licensed man. I said, Duke, I studied to pass a test. I didn't study to learn anything. There is a difference. There is a difference. I am afraid that sometimes we study this just so we can say we've studied it. We studied this just so we can quote the verse. We can study this, we study this just so we can be able to answer the question when the teacher calls on us in Bible class. We don't really study this to let God speak to us to get us through the problems we've got in life. I'm afraid sometimes we study this like I studied the material for that above ground storage tank. I didn't study to learn, I studied to pass a test. We need to learn what that says so when I face those, all those problems going on in life, I won't allow them to get in here because I'll be filled with God and God's not gonna leave me here by myself. He's not going to leave me on my own to face all those. He's going to be there for me. Now, 
What does he want from us? The faithful endurance of trials. God wants me to faithfully endure in my faith during a time of trial. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Whether we're talking about the early Christians that were being persecuted because they said they believed in Jesus, whether we're talking about those that are suffering social injustice because they're being excommunicated or being left on the outside because of their faith in Jesus, whether we're talking about illnesses or diseases or poverty or financial setbacks or relationship problems, trials are not easy to endure at any time. And if I have given you any idea that enduring a trial is easy, let me dispel that now. They're not. They're all tough. There is no other way to put it. But James has said all along, everywhere we've looked down through here, that the first priority of the Christian is to persevere. You go back to verses 3 and 4, where we started. He says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. That's what we're after. We're after endurance. We're after steadfastness. We want to be faithful. We are to see a trial through to its completion and remain faithful. We may not always be victorious in the way that we want. I wish I could tell you you'd be faithful. All those problems will work out the way you want them to. I can't do that. You go back and think about the early Christians that were thrown to the lions or crucified or burned at the stake. They were faithful to the end. But their trials didn't work out the way they wanted them to. But they were victorious. And our trials may not work out the way that we want them to. We may suffer financial reversal. We may have problems with our kids that we don't know if we'll ever get them repaired. We may have other things that don't work out. But as long as we are faithful, we will be victorious. We must never give up or allow those trials to overcome us. And look what he says to start there. He says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. We're, we're familiar with that kind of language. The, the word blessed there is that word that means when you, you ha will have the kind of joy on the inside that the things of the outside can't disturb. It, it, some translations go happy as man. Happiness is you're excited about what's happening around you. Blessed is you've got it on the inside. It doesn't make any difference what's going on on the outside. But we're familiar with that kind of, of language. If you go to Psalm 1, let's see if I can turn to it. Psalm chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. The other, we remember Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. 3 through 10, the, the Beatitudes, where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are are, are the meek and on down the line. Or Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed are the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear. Now, I, I'm going to do something a little different here. Probably by the, this is the end of the week, you're not too surprised that I do things differently sometimes. I say that at Prayer Grove and they go, what are you going to do now, Bill? <laughs> uh, about three years ago, I was preaching through the Sermon on the Mount. And I was studying the Beatitudes, and that light bulb goes off in my head. And I got to think, you know, for 40 years, I've been preaching these wrong. I've been 
emphasizing the wrong things in the Beatitudes. Let me see if I can illustrate it from James here in the passage that we're looking at. If you look at James chapter 1, he said, blessed is the man. Now, we have a tendency, whether we're studying this passage or whether we're studying the Beatitudes, up till about three years ago, whenever I preached the Beatitudes, I always spent time talking about what it meant to mourn, what it meant to be meek, what it meant to, to be poor in spirit. But that's not the blessing that Jesus was talking about. That's the attribute that he expects you to have. When he says you're going to be blessed, it's, it's, the blessing is not being poor in spirit. The blessing is not being meek. The blessing is not the mourning. He does, he, he goes on. Now, now look what James does. He says, blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial. That's why you're blessed, because you've remained steadfast under trial. Then he says, because you will receive the crown of life. What's the blessing? The crown of life. The blessing is not the remaining steadfast. The blessing is the crown of life. The blessing for the Beatitudes is not being poor in spirit. It's seeing God. Those are the things that we need to remember. So the Christian who's victorious in his struggle against trials is going to be rewarded. God rewards. Hebrews chapter 11 says, if you're going to have faith, you have to believe that God is and what? What's the next part? And rewards those who diligently seek Him. God is a rewarder. We stay steadfast. We stay to the end. We see the trial through. We will be victorious. Maybe not in the way that we want to be, but we will be victorious. This verse says the same thing to me that Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 says. I was growing up, we used to have to learn the plan of salvation. We still need to learn the plan of salvation. But I learned it. It wasn't the five steps in the plan of salvation. It was the six steps. It's hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and... Be faithful. And the verse that we use to emphasize the be faithful part was Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. And, and it, yeah, you can use it for that, but I want you to look what it says. It says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. They were about to go through some terrible persecution. They were going to be killed for their faith. They were going to watch their children be killed. They would be family separated because of their faith. They would be given a choice, Lord Jesus or Lord Caesar. And if they said the wrong thing, they would die. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Not 10 literal days. For a period of time, you're going to go through tribulation. Be faithful unto death. Allow me to give you Hooten's translation of that. Be faithful even if it kills you. And I will give you the crown of life. See, John said in Revelation the very same thing that James said in James chapter 1. Stay faithful, steadfast, persevere to the end, and you'll be victorious. You might die, but you'll be victorious. That's the blessing that James is talking about. Second thing that James tells us in our text for now is don't blame God for your failures. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James says, don't blame God when bad things happen. Don't blame God for your troubles, things that are going on. Every time there's a test, it seems like some pass and some fail. If we fail, we, we like to pass the buck. We want to give the responsibility to somebody else. How many times you heard your children say, what, he started it. Or she made me do it. Or any number of things like that. Or your child, teenager comes home from school and they have flunked the test. Craig, your kids never did that, did they? Mine, you know my kids, they all did that. They come home and they flunked the test. Well, it was just too hard, Dad. Well, that te- we hadn't even talked about the stuff we were tested over. The teacher just set the curve too high for that one. You see, it's not my fault. I gotta, I gotta blame somebody else. Of course, the classic example that I remember from when I was about yay high, saying, well, the devil made me do it. We want to blame somebody else. We want to pass the buck on. James for the problems we have. That some of us are going to say, God, it's your fault that I'm not what I ought to be. It's your fault that I'm having these problems. If you read extra-biblical Jewish literature, you will read where the Jews believed that man was a walking civil war that he had a good side and a bad side, and there was a constant struggle going on and on. And and I I don't know that I'd go to the extreme that they did. I've I've often said, I've I've got a little angel sitting over here whispering in my ear, say, Bill, that's what you need to do. And then I got a great big red devil sitting over here, say, don't do that, Bill. It is a struggle. We struggle with doing what's right. You say, Bill, you really struggle with, yeah, I really struggle. You know what, I'm not the only one. Romans chapter seven, verses 15 through 20, the apostle Paul says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do not If I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin dwells within me. If you followed through all that, what did Paul say? What he said was, there's sometimes I do things that I know I shouldn't do, but I do them anyway. And then then he says, and then there's these other times that there are these things that I know that I ought to do, but I don't get them done. I don't do them. Anybody identify with that? Anybody understand? And that's the Apostle Paul talking. It is is something that we recognize and and know in in our lives. There's people today that want to blame God. You ever heard anybody say, You know, God just made me the way I am. I'm not responsible. If he hadn't wanted me to do that, he wouldn't have made me this way. If God hadn't made me like this, I I wouldn't have done that. Or I'm only human. My mama used to get on to me and said, you know better than that. You shouldn't have done that. And I said, Mom, I'm only human. 
trying to pass the buck off to somebody else instead of accepting responsibility for it. That's the way we've always been. We all have been that way. Do you remember what Adam said when the Lord asked him why? That woman you gave me, gave it to me. What did he say? Lord, it ain't my fault. It's yours. You shouldn't have given her to me. If you hadn't given it to me, she wouldn't have given it to me, and I wouldn't eat it. People ask me sometimes, said, you know, Scripture says that Eve was deceived. Everybody read the Scripture where Eve was deceived? They said, Eve was deceived. What was Adam's problem? Stupidity. He wasn't deceived. He was just stupid. That's about all you can say about him. There's no denying that God allows us trials in our lives that we can be tested. Go back and read the Old Testament. Think about Job. You want to talk about a fellow that had a few problems along the way? Job had them. Think about Abraham. You think Abraham ever struggled believing in God? Abraham, you're going to have a son. Lord, you said that 50 years ago, and I still ain't got that son. Just believe me. Lord, I'm too old. Sarah's too old. Just believe me. Abraham struggled. Joseph struggled in prison. Moses was raised to believe that he was going to be the deliverer. I, I'm convinced that he, he was taught by his mother that God has spared you, that you can deliver your people, that you can be the Savior for them and lead them out of here. And, and then he runs and hides in a wilderness for 40 years. You think that was a struggle for him? To go from Pharaoh's house to being a shepherd living in the wilderness and then to lead the people in all the problems that they gave him. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. God allowed Jesus to be tested. God sent Jesus into the wilderness to endure the trials that Satan was going to give him. God allows testing to produce endurance or to make us stronger. I mean, that's, you ask me what this is about this week, that's, that's the lesson right there. God allows us trials, troubles, struggles to make us stronger to practice faith. Isn't that what we ask for, though? Lord, please let me be humble. Give me humility that I won't think too highly of myself. Bill, if you do, you've got real problems. Now, I ask for humility, or I ask for patience, or I ask for self-control, or I ask for help controlling my temper. How's he going to give that to me? Well, we talked about this. He's going to give me the opportunity to be humble. He may humble me. He's going to give me the opportunity to be patient. He's going to give me the opportunity to practice self-control. He's going to give me the opportunity to control my temper. And if I ask him for a stronger faith, he's going to give me the opportunity to be steadfast, endure, persevere, that my faith can be stronger. James chapter 1, verse 13, says, God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. We cannot blame God for our struggles. We can't say, God, you made me this way. It, it's, it's just who I am. We can't put it off on him. God doesn't tempt us. It comes from inside of us. God provides us with an opportunity to do good. And the temptation to do evil is from inside of us. You cannot help being tempted. Some of us are struggling with temptation as we're sitting in here tonight even. You cannot help but be tempted. But you don't have to yield to it. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. 
But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed. Jack, what does that remind you of? Lured and enticed? That's, fishing's what comes to my mind. I went to Lake Fork to go fishing for big bass down there, and everybody told me that Texas fish bite red bait. If you go to Lake Fork, you gotta have Texas red because you want to lure them, you want to entice them, and red lures and entices them. Didn't help, but that's what they told me anyway. We are lured and enticed by what? Our own desire. True confession time. And you don't have to, I will. I have been up front. I had surgery a year and a half ago for weight loss. I've lost about 120 pounds. Every day is a struggle. Surgery is not a magic bullet. It helps. It is not a magic bullet. I'm home by myself today, typing my lesson for tonight. Here's the stove, and right here is a jar about this big around, about that tall. Guess what's in it? Jelly beans. Every time I walk by them, Were they, were they do, was, was, were they, those jelly beans doing anything? No, they were just sitting there in that jar. Where was the temptation? Inside of me. We're lured and enticed by our own desire. Those struggles that we have come from inside of us. They are the things that we have to learn how to control. Then he says, if you're lured and enticed, and if you give in to your desire, what happens? It gives birth to sin. Yeah, I ate some jelly beans today. You know, that, that's really not hard to explain, the idea of giving birth to sin. We're lured and enticed by our own desire, and it gives birth to sin. When I first started working for Arkansas Insulation, I never worked with Hispanics. It, that was a new experience for me. And it was really a new experience because I didn't speak Spanish, and they didn't speak English. And I was writing job orders for them to go out and to do, and, and learning to communicate was a real problem. And one morning I showed up, and, and I knew that this one particular Luis had a job that I needed him to do, and I met him leaving as I was going in, and I could tell he wasn't going to work. I said, Luis. He stopped. Where are you going? I don't think he had any idea what I said. He said, he understood. I won't know where he's going. I said, why? He said, wife. <laughs> She's fixing to give birth. When we're lured and enticed by our own desire, it gives birth to sin because of what goes on within us. And what is the end result of sin? Brings forth death. Now, look at that. Back up to the Garden of Eden. Think about that for just a moment. Look at those things. Lured and enticed. Was Eve lured and enticed? What does it say about her being lured and enticed? What, did, what lured her and enticed her? Well, I can be like God. That 
piece of fruit really looks good. And third, it's good to eat. I've always, Jack, how'd you bite out of it? One of the two. So she was lured during the days of James, and we have them now. Pretty simple formula. Satan has his bait casting reel out. He's got something really attractive on it, and he's throwing it out in front of you, and he's wiggling it and working it in, luring and enticing you to take it. You've got to decide if you're going to persevere. Now, the problem comes when I'm hurting, when I'm struggling with something, when I've got a problem, when things aren't going the way they ought to be going, and I'm struggling with that, and, and nothing is going right, and, and I feel bad, and everything is terrible. Satan throws that out there in front of me. Maybe that'd bring me some relief to do that. Maybe that'd be a good thing to do. Maybe that would help me. And I am enticed and lured by my own desire, and that brings forth sin, which brings forth we still struggle with that. I want to close with one final passage. If I can get to it. For the wages of sin is death. When you're lured and enticed, you give in to your desires. It brings forth sin. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God wants to save us. God wants to, he wants to save us so much that he sent his son to die for you. You know, there are lots of people in here I like, care a lot about, but I got two boys. I wouldn't give either one of my boys for the whole bunch of you. I love my boys, but God gave his son for us. He says, here he is. These are the expectations I have for you. Will you accept them? Then he, and then, well, I don't know if I can do it. He says, well, I know you can't, but I'll help you. I'll be there for you. All you have to do is call. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, the crown of life. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for Jesus. Father, we're humble to think about how much you've done and what you're willing to do and the blessings that are ours. Father, be with us because we all have struggles. We all have problems. Father, help us to overcome. Help us to persevere. Help us to be steadfast, to have endurance. Father, we want to live with you forever. That is our goal, our dream, our aspirations, our hope. Father, be with us. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. If they hurry, they can get their Sundays before the kids get there. Yeah. If you don't keep them here for a while. I'll probably hold them back. Okay. Well, I know many of you will want to tell Bill personally how much you appreciate the lessons. I know there's, for me personally, that I've found a lot of takeaways in these four nights. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I'm studying this book, not for a test, but to learn how to live. And, uh, and I appreciate that thought. And uh, there's so many others. And I hope you found uh, some takeaways that you can uh, apply. I know you have, and hope you can remember them. I hope we can be bold to do so. 
Again, thank you so much for uh, giving yourself an opportunity to grow in faith and knowledge this week. And I pray God will bless you uh, immensely in the days to come because of this study together. And when we face trials and troubles or whatever, that uh, you'll go back to the book of James and be reminded of, the pra- of one of the most, if not the most practical book in the Bible of, of how to live and how to live in faith. We thank you, and we have Sundays downstairs, is what I understand. And uh, Bill says if we get out of here before the next bell rings, you might get there before they do. So, again, adios, amigos, hasta luego.